in, in one sense, nobody has to worry that the government is going to default in nominal terms. If the government owes you, you know, you bought a bond for a thousand dollars, and uh, you know it's a short term thing, and they're going to owe you whatever a thousand or fifty dollars at the end of the year. Um, nobody has to worry that they can't come up with a thousand or fifty dollars because they also happen to be the most liquid credit market in the world because they print, they, they crave the dollar. Um, and they're addicted to it because their debts are in dollars. And it's really a debt-driven world. As the global economy struggles to recover from a devastating pandemic and faces escalating geopolitical tensions, an unprecedented fiscal crisis looms, a public debt crisis that could reshape the global financial landscape for generations. By 2024, global public debt is expected to surpass $100 trillion, representing 93% of global GDP and is projected to reach nearly 100% by 2024-2030. This level has already exceeded pre-pandemic figures, highlighting a grim reality. Global public debt is projected to soar to 115% of global GDP within the next three years, according to the International Monetary Fund, the world's lender of last resort. Keith Weiner, founder and CEO of Monetary Metals, asserts that every other debtor would likely default before the U.S., making the risk of a government default in nominal terms minimal. Weiner, somewhat facetiously, describes the global economy as a dollar world, where the dollar functions as the primary reserve currency, while all other currencies act as derivatives, essentially serving as local scripts in comparison. The global financial system is heavily dominated by the U.S. dollar, which constitutes approximately 90% of all currency trades. Until recently, nearly all oil transactions were conducted in U.S. dollars. However, by 2023, about one-fifth of these trades were reportedly carried out in other currencies. Despite this shift, the dollar still accounts for 58% of the value of global foreign reserve holdings, while the euro, the next most used currency, makes up just 20%. Keith Weiner interprets this as a clear indication of widespread demand, and even dependency, on the dollar worldwide. For him, this reliance underscores a debt-driven global economy with people and institutions heavily reliant on the dollar to meet their debt obligations. Let's delve into the video to gain further insights. Before we begin, consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon to stay updated with the latest content. The U.S. government is the least marginal debtor in the entire world. By that I mean every other debtor, every other entity on the planet who owes dollars will default before the U.S. government does. So in, in one sense, nobody has to worry that the government is going to default in nominal terms. If the government owes you, you, know, you bought a bond for $1,000 and uh, you know it's a short-term thing, and they're going to owe you whatever a thousand or fifty dollars at the end of the year. Um, nobody has to worry that they can't come up with a thousand or fifty dollars because they also happen to be the most liquid credit market in the world because they print. And I, I, I use that term with a certain facetiousness, but you know, for purposes of this conversation, it's clear enough. They print the world's money. We're in a dollar world. All the other currencies are dollar derivatives, but they're also like local script. You, you know, to me, the debate of whether some other paper currency is going to surpass the dollar. I, I imagine if there was um, some coal mining company in Western, you know, West Virginia, that some of the townspeople in their ignorance thought that the company, you know, the coal mining company was so big and so powerful that its script was going to actually displace the dollar. Maybe they had arguments over beers in there, but it's, it's pretty naive. It's a dollar world. And, you know, everywhere you go, I mean, I like to call it the taxi cab test. You're in a place where it's not a dollar country and you take out a dollar bill or dollar bills. Well, the taxi cab driver take it so um i was in probably the most extreme case i was in switzerland and i made the mistake of taking a taxi without checking if they accept credit cards i've gotten to the point where i just assume everyone accepts credit cards but i don't bother you know i carry some dollar bills with me just in an emergency but i don't not a lot of them but i don't um i don't trade them for local you know currency because it isn't worth it you always end up with change so what do you do with all that and um the, the fare was 20 point something like six 20.6 francs and I didn't take credit cards. I'm like, oh shit. He's like, well, go to the ATM. I was like, I don't have any ATM access here. So I took out a 20, and he was like, oh shit, now what are we gonna do? I took out a $20 bill. Now, the franc was a dollar six, and this was 20.6 francs. So at a dollar six, that was 21 something, right? I took out a $20 bill. I didn't have any singles. He smiled. Not only did he accept it, he was happy mm -hmm. to snatch that $20 bill out of my hands. You're good. So, um, you know, everybody's happy with the dollar. They, they crave the dollar. Um, and they're addicted to it because their debts are in dollars. 
and it's really a debt-driven world. The sharp increase in debt originates from substantial stimulus measures enacted during the COVID-19 pandemic to stabilize the economy amidst widespread lockdowns. While these actions mitigated immediate economic disruptions, they also contributed to rising inflation, prompting the Federal Reserve to impose significant interest rate hikes. This combination has introduced lasting fiscal challenges, with some analysts cautioning that the Fed now faces a nightmare scenario, balancing the dual pressures of controlling inflation while managing soaring debt costs. According to Keith Weiner, when interest rates decrease, they provide a strong incentive for producers to expand. He explains that for many businesses, decisions to open new stores or increase production are closely tied to interest costs, which are essential in calculating profitability. However, Viner warns that this pattern can lead to a vicious spiral. While lower interest rates initially boost GDP by encouraging expansion, rising rates have the opposite effect, triggering layoffs, bankruptcies, and economic contraction as businesses struggle to manage increased financing costs. Now let's redirect our attention to a video. Every time the interest rate ticks down, every producer who has a spreadsheet to add one more you know, store to the hamburger chain, to add one more line to their factory, they all, they all have a spreadsheet that is, is the business case for adding capacity. And, that, and, and the reason why they haven't added more capacity is because at the margin, that spreadsheet has red ink at the bottom. It says, don't do it. Now, one of the bigger expenses in any of these endeavors is the interest expense in financing the expansion. So if they come along and lower the interest rate, some of these spreadsheets at the margin flip from red to black ink. They're actually profitable at that point because you've lowered a co an important cost in, in the equation. And so every time the interest rate's ticking down, every producer of everything is now has a fresh incentive to borrow and expand capacity. Now, unless the demand for that hamburger is going up, um, what you get is very soft, you know, prices that, uh, you know, there's just essentially more and more capacity being added, but people aren't necessarily eating more hamburgers or the only way to induce them to eat more hamburgers is to push down the price of the burger. So you're hitting the bid of the marginal consumer. Um, so as the interest rate's going down, it's just, it's just essentially an increased subsidy to every producer of everything to borrow more and to increase production capacity. And so uh, in my view, there's an arbitrage between the rate of return on capital and the cost of capital. And so I published an article Keith Weiner's macro equation, I think is the title that our marketing team gave it. And the macro equation is R must be greater than I. Return on capital must be greater than the cost of capital, which is the interest rate. Um, now, when the interest rate goes in the other direction, then return on capital must rise to be always above the cost of capital. Well, if everybody and his brother has been for 40 years building more and more and more hamburger restaurants, how do you get higher return on capital on hamburger restaurants? Well, you have to bankrupt and ruin X number of stores to decrease the supply such that the remaining guys have the pricing power to increase their prices and eventually get um, you know return on capital up of course that's a world where everybody's doing that and therefore a lot of layoffs and therefore the demand for hamburgers is falling and so you have what was what seemed like a virtuous spiral when uh, interest rates were falling and you keep juicing up more and more and more gdp by falling interest rates well when you hike interest rates you're going to create this vicious spiral of things going the opposite direction it's not a lot of fun because bankruptcies are quite asymmetrical to um you you know, business expansions. And actually, we're seeing right now restaurant chain after restaurant chain. I just read TGI Fridays uh, is about to go into bankruptcy. That was the news I read today. But, you know, others have been doing it. This is why. And the articles never talk about it. It's the debt, right? They can't service all the debt that was incurred when the, when the Fed funds rate was zero. Now that the Fed funds rate is 5%, they can't service it. You know, when the when the old bond matures and now they have to sell a new bond, there's no way that they can service the debt at this uh, at this price. And so they just have to throw their arms up and say, we need to restructure. We need to wipe out all of our creditors. Many developing nations face a complex and urgent challenge, one that is as severe as it is layered. Approximately 54 of the world's poorest economies are trapped in a financial bind, where the pressing need to attract investment for economic growth conflicts with an equally critical need to reduce debt. This tension is especially pronounced as debt levels rise to nearly two-thirds of GDP, while growth rates struggle to keep pace, barely making a dent in the debt burden. How might rising debt in developing nations affect the global economy in the next decade? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. If you found this content helpful, give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe to stay updated. Thank you for being a part of this journey with us.